This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. For this special issue in Heart Rhythm this month, we have two guests on our show to really discuss two breaking articles that provide new insights into the Brugada syndrome. Welcome, Drs. Michelle Hasagera and Dr. Kunwali Nadmani. Good morning. And thank you for joining us from Bangkok, Thailand, and thank you for joining us from Bordeaux, France. It's really a pleasure to have two pioneers, two giants in electrophysiology, discuss two papers this month. And there's a lot for us to cover, so we'll dive into it. What we found is that there's two articles that are discussing the new dynamic nature of some of the substrate in which we're doing provocative studies with extra stimulation, atrial pacing, and showing the effects and the impact on the local electrograms. Michelle, maybe you can start off by talking about what the new findings are with multi-site epicardial block. Um, I would say that from the result from we and uh, from uh, our lab, uh, using different and complementary method, I would say that the Brugada syndrome uh, is a special substrate with multiple sites, multiple is very important, exhibiting conduction block, not only prolongation of conduction, as it has been said by uh, in other studies, but we have a total abolition and no reactivation from contiguous site, which are, uh, however, uh, activated. So we see during extra stimuli or during actual pacing, we see no conduction, and despite reactivation of all surrounding sites, it's like if we see some black hole in the epicardium of Brugada syndrome. That is fascinating. And here in one of the exemplary figures, maybe you can take us through this, Michelle, with the response to extra stimuli. Yeah, we see uh, uh, at, the coping, at the first coping interval 440, we see a prolongation of uh, uh, local electrograms, then we see steam more prolongation, and you can guess some decomposition of the potential. Uh, you see B indicated uh, no activation, and at the end of the last coping interval, 320, all sites are blocked. There is no reactivation from surrounding area, and this is very spectacular. I think this is uh, indicating a very special substrate which is probably uh, unusual also in cardiomyopathy or in post-myocardial infarction. But this is still to be proven. And obviously for our viewers, we wanna make sure that they understand to compare that with the endocardium, which the endocardial RVOT is not exhibiting that behavior. Again, showing that this is something more isolated and originally from the epicardium. Michelle, does this, these findings of the changes with with uh, the extra stimuli support more of a depolarization mechanism and hypothesis? Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's clearly a, b a big stone in the garden <laughs> of, de of depolarization. That means depolarization is a primary mechanism of Brugada syndrome in all the human case we have seen and that we have seen too. But uh, what is spectacular is repolarization has also very striking changes related to uh, depolarization change. And this indicates that the secondary impact of repolarization may also add some additional um, impact on uh, the mechanism. It's a primary depolarization mechanism uh, with very uh, striking, important repolarization changes, which are secondary. Thank you. And, and Dr. Nidmani, in the second paper, which is really discussing the impact and the mechanisms of the effects of sodium channel blockade, you also do atrial pacing in 32 patients. And really important and striking was the actual biopsy in four patients that required intraoperative approach. Maybe you can take us through this very important figure in the second manuscript here to describe what you're seeing with the electrogram changes with asmoline. Yes, Rod. Um, this figure, uh, which shows the in the middle, the grid over the right ventricular outflow tract, 
of the patient that we did the open chest thoracotomy. And the area uh, that we are number, it show the uh, area of the RVOT from top to the, to the mid of the RV. What we are showing uh, specifically in uh, three, uh, four area. On the top left is the area three that show the before Ashmaline and the, the second um, uh, left, top left is the after Ashmaline. And it, that area, you can see here that during uh, baseline, the electrogram that record from the area three um, and showing the arrow and the top of the RVOT, it was normal. But after fractionate electrogram, the bipolar electrogram show fractionate and prolonged relation of the electrogram. More importantly, if you look at the unipolar, it looked like a monophasic uh, action potential. And that is because it's uh, the phenomena that has been well described in the in silico model and then in the case report that uh, the, that area of the failure of excitation could cause the current to load mismatch. And it can mimic the, uh, from the unipolar recording in that site to show the uh, uh, monophasic uh, action potential uh, like uh, recording. So the lower left, the area 13, show the same, uh, same thing. And then on the top right, uh, area eight, and also show another beautiful normal looking electrogram during uh, baseline and then fractionated and monophasic uh, uh, recording during uh, in the unipolar. And the, most importantly, the lower right, uh, I show the Mason dichrome stain of the tissue that we uh, um, did the biopsy on the area 13. We also did a biopsy on the area eight that didn't show here that it showed the same thing that show then collagen and fibrosis in the epicardium and some and, and in the, some uh, in the uh, in myocardium as well. That basically this figure show that there's a subtle fibrosis in the substrate of the RVOT. And, and, and re recording a baseline may not un, uh, show any abnormal electrogram only when you have sodium channel reduction, um, a current reduction, uh, then the uh, substrate became much easier to, to detect. And that's it, very important. And it also, and it also created the curb type Bukata phenotype. So it's really nice to be able to show that you, the unipolar, which is really what Dr. Hasegir was discussing in you, is showing the current of injury where it almost looks like a localized Brugada pattern um, as you start delaying this, which is really quite beautiful. So it, it's been 11 years since you first described, Dr. Nedmani, the seminal report in circulation about the ablation to be able to help these patients with, that are desperate with ventricular fibrillation. What do you think is the biggest change of our understanding now with Brugada over the past 10 years with these new data? Well, the biggest change, uh, as you know, the first, 10, the first decade of Brugada syndrome, we all believe that uh, the mechanism underlying Brugada syndrome, either for phenotype or arrhythmia uh, or VF genesis, but due to repolarization. But the past two decades, which has been three decades now since the Bugatti syndrome was described by Joseph and Pedro, that it became that it has clearly them uh, shown that from from Michelle work from our work and from a, a lot of Arthur Paponi and many um, that I can cite them all uh, very clearly that depolarization is a prevailing mechanism, and the fact that we in all our patients that we have done biopsy on. Uh, they're also uh, subtle fibrosis that may not be able to detect it by the regular cardiac imaging, uh, even regular MRI, but it only can be seen by the, by the uh, biopsy of the specimen. And Dr. Hasegira, I would love for you to summarize for you what has happened over the past decade with your current understanding of Brugada syndrome. Um... I would say uh, from the initial paper by uh, Wina Demani, uh, we have uh, 
we have we have understood that epicardium substrate can be uh, by itself um, a huge uh, substrate for a patient with apparently normal heart or uh, purely electrical abnormality. And um, what we have seen then that the link with fibrosis uh, that we that is still confirmed today, and the the, the possibility of ablation developed by. Uh, Joseph Brigada and uh, Dr. Papol. Now, uh, we have not seen so much uh, uh, improvement in, in uh, the substrate. And uh, if, if it's something that is genetic and how much of uh, external factor can influence uh, the, the um, occurrence of Brigada syndrome. Well, what what we what we surprised me uh, in the this paper and this in this study with uh, Willa de Mani, uh, I was surprised by uh, the fact that in a very small uh, region we can have a mosaic of electrical activity, which is very spectacular, and probably this can be uh, an explanation for this patient having much more VF than VT, because the propagation has uh, so many options that probably uh, we have a, a lot of reentry that explain more VF than VT. And I'm wondering if some patient with VF in other type of substrate like ARVD or uh, some cardiomyopathy manifesting only by VF may maybe have this special substrate, this special microstructural substrate explaining uh, the occurrence of rather VF than VT. So based on these four patients, the biopsies really suggest a fibrotic, you know, structural substrate. Michelle, do you believe that this is generalizable to all patients with Brugada syndrome? Um, I would say that the great, great majority of Brugada syndrome human patients, of course, have some uh, fibrosis. Uh, now, uh, it is sure that what we have observed in the animal experiment by the group of Anzelevich, it is sure that we may have some Brugada syndrome purely um, induced by pharmacological drugs. This is observed in, uh, in uh, animals, but it, we can imagine that it will be possible, probably exceptionally in human. Um, and we have a case of Brugada syndrome, uh, which has died. And we are working on it using optical mapping and uh, high resolution MRI. And this patient seems not to have fibrosis, but he had a severe SCN5 mutation. So it may be in some patient, a very severe mutation or multi uh, gene mutation can probably in exceptional case have a Brugada syndrome without any fibrosis. But 99% for sure have a fibrosis that we can target for ablation as uh, we Nade Nade show it. Dr. Nadmani, anything to add about whether no, all I, I, patients? I, I totally agree with uh, Michelle. So far, of all patients that we have done, uh, we show fibrosis. The only question is the extent of the fibrosis uh, comparing asymptomatic patient and symptomatic patient may be different. But I think they all have fibrosis. Yeah, or functionally, or functionally have a different behavior also is an option. Well, this has been so wonderful to be able to dive and pick the minds of two really pioneering clinician scientists and dive into the micro substrate and look at the functional nature of how we're appreciating that it appears when you look at these electrograms and you read these two papers, that this is primarily more of a depolarization abnormality with some sort of underlying substrate, And it's so wonderful to see that there's the fibrosis with the open heart surgical biopsies. And this all adds to our evolving understanding of Brugada syndrome. I wanna thank you, Dr. Hasagera, and thank you, Dr. Nadmani, for joining us in your respective time zones and your respective countries and for all the contributions you've made and for all the things you've taught us uh, in the field of electrophysiology. We appreciate it from Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you.